Hello and welcome to the Hail Mary, the GPP NFL podcast for week nine. I'm Big Italy 42. He is Josh Shepardson at Beachhead 50. Talking about some of your favorite GPP plays for this week. Obviously, I'm on board with a lot of them here. Starting with uh, one of the top scorers from last week, Eli Manning. Um, six touchdown passes. And while we can't quite expect six touchdown passes yet again this week or maybe ever, ever again, but... What we can expect is that his number one receiver, Odo Beckham Jr., is going to be able to feast against a team that Football Outsiders has as the worst team in all of football against number one receivers. Yeah, and if uh, OBJ is feasting, that means Eli Manning's feasting. And it's not often that a quarterback who tosses six touchdown passes is the B-side of a marquee shootout. But last week, Breeze threw for seven touchdowns. Manning coming off of just a six-touchdown performance, but uh, in good form. He's had a handful of very strong efforts where he's thrown for multiple touchdowns. Also had a few clunkers mixed in there, but I guess the bad Bucks offense, I'm expecting the good Manning to show up this week. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about how one of the Mannings needs to keep t- throwing touchdown passes because his brother Peyton stopped, so um, he's he's uh, he's carrying on the, the Manning legacy that uh, Peyton decided to he. I don't know. He decided he wanted to hand the ball off. Maybe it's less work on his body. Who knows? Um, next up, one of the sexy picks from early in the season. Missed some time with injury. Tyrod Taylor. Um, finally back. And this is a guy that gives you a nice high floor because he runs with the ball. And um, if if he is able to have success on the ground, not only does he give you the high floor, but, you know, four points for a passing touchdown, six points for a rushing touchdown, he provides you with a little bit more upside there uh, when you factor yep. that in as well. Yeah, has a couple rushing scores on the year and has been uh, better than an adequate passer. He's averaging over eight yards per pass attempt this year, completing more than 70% of his passes and ranked sixth in uh, passer rating this year. So uh, doing well through the air, maybe not on a volume from a volume perspective, but from an efficiency perspective, he's he's done well. Nine touchdowns, just four interceptions, so he's taking care of the football. But as you noted, got to love what he can do with the legs as well. And uh, the other thing to really love about Tyrod Taylor is price point. Uh, Very affordable at both FanDuel and DraftKings, where he's only $300 above the minimum salary for a quarterback. So uh, rostering him allows you a ton of flexibility to fit in some of the other studs highlighted in the GPP article and just some of the other studs in general around the league. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to get up to some of these big big names, especially wide receiver, then certainly certainly going to need to save somewhere. Um, Here's a guy that'll help you do that also, Jonathan Stewart. Price on DraftKings just Never wants to raise. It was 4100 last week. Now it's only 43 You mentioned here he's low-owned as he was last week, and he's getting a lot of volume. He hasn't quite had that big breakout game that we've all been kind of hoping for in GPPs. But at that DraftKings price, though, you don't necessarily have to have a huge ceiling. He can easily pay his price tag off without a big game. Yeah, and I mean, this is a guy that's carried the ball 20 or more times in three straight contests. In one of those contests, he went over 100 yards, and the other two, he found pay dirt. So you're you're getting production from him. Not a big threat in the passing game, but again, at his price, he doesn't need to be a big threat in the passing game. Uh, has a matchup that's quite soft. Packers allowing 4.7 yards per carry this year, allowed 4.7 yards per carry last year to the Broncos, who absolutely ran all over them with both C.J. Anderson and Ronnie Hillman. And uh, if you're going to compare Stewart to one of the two back there, uh, I'd say he projects fairly similarly to C.J. Anderson, a bigger back who's got a little bit of shiftiness in his game. And uh, Anderson went for over 100 last week against them. I see no reason to uh, expect Stewart to fall short of that 100-yard threshold if he's going to get around 20 carries this week. And uh, the spread's close, and the Panthers don't have a lot of offensive weapons. So this is a team that's built on running the football and playing really good defense. So I like Stewart a lot this week. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call there. Um, Next up after him, we've got another cheap running back, Jeremy Langford. Um, This is an injury replacement situation where we've got Matt Forte finally today officially listed (laughs) out for this week. We kind of knew the entire time he wasn't going to play. Um, They they expected two weeks, but either way, we're talking about this week. Jeremy Langford, um, not quite the pass-catching back that Forte is, but, I mean, few players really are. So he's not going to be able to step – he's stepping into that role, not directly into that entire role. But this is an offense that's been – effective over the past couple weeks too so um they've had success in the passing game so this isn't a situation where you can just load up the box to stop the run and not have to worry about the passing attack because that passing attack with Alshon Jeffrey and Jay Cutler should open up plenty for the running game here yeah and the game has a nice juicy over under total of 49 points uh the Bears can score some points and they're facing the worst ranked uh, run defense in the league whether you're looking at it from a reality perspective as Football Outsiders does ranking them dead last 
or from a fantasy perspective, they're giving up the most fantasy points per game to opposing running backs. So talk about a cushy landing spot for Langford's first NFL start. And I mean, he's a guy that's got some speed. He uh, posted the high, the best 40 time amongst running backs this year's NFL draft combine. And uh, he was a productive college runner. So not the pass catcher catching back the forte is, as you noted, but uh, is an effective runner and should get some volume. And what isn't, wasn't bad on a relief of forte last week, 46 yards on 12 carries, Falling short of four yards per carry isn't exactly great, but uh, faced a stiffer defense of the uh, Vikings and didn't embarrass himself by any stretch. So I really like the matchup, really like the price point for him to deliver value. Maybe not the highest ceiling player, which usually we want a, a monster ceiling in GPPs. I really like the salary relief. I do think he has something of a ceiling, but that salary relief to spend on the receivers is... Uh, is something that I value quite a bit this week. Yeah, I mean, you could pair those two guys um, and get, well, some of these other guys mentioning, especially the next guy we're about to talk about, Odell Beckham, um, $8,800 on <coughs> Kings. He's expensive me. on FanDuel as well. But we saw last week, eight catches, um, but so, probably one of the better eight catch lines you're ever going to see, eight for 130 and three touchdowns. Uh, as you mentioned here, talk about efficient. So um, it's between he and Julio Jones, you imagine, his top play. And you're, I'm not sure who's going to have the lower ownership. I don't think it necessarily matters. I think both guys have huge ceiling. But I, I tend to lean towards Odell Beckham here because I'm not convinced that the 49ers can compete. So I, I think that uh, um, the Julio Jones train might kind of uh, come to a stop at halftime if that game gets out of hand. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's, you're splitting hairs if you're going to pick on uh, one defense being worse than the other. The uh, Bucks rank 32nd defending number ones, the Niners rank 31st, but it is a slight slight uh, edge for Odell Beckham Jr. And uh, the fact is he's got less weapons to deal with than, than Julio Jones. I mean, Devontae Freeman is a fantastic running back who's getting the ball a lot. Um, you have other pass catchers. I mean, the, the zombie of... Roddy White is still lurking there. Jacob Tammy's caught some passes for them. Um, but Odell Beckham's a one-man show in New York for the Giants. And uh, I like the total in that game, 49.5. It's a close enough spread that you don't expect uh, the Giants to be in such predictable passing situations that it becomes problematic. Um, but they will air it out because that's just how their offense is built. So I really like Odell Beckham Jr. a lot this week. Of the trio of elite receivers, I like Beckham Jr. better than both Julio Jones and... Uh, Alshon Jeffrey, namely because Jeffrey's ownership is going to be through the roof. And uh, Odell Beckham, even though we shoot for ceiling, I like the higher floor with him as well than uh, than Julio Jones. Yeah, and like you mentioned, uh, DraftKings specifically, Alshon Jeffrey's um, yeah. his, uh, ownership is going to be absolutely insane. And I mean, rightfully so with that price tag. But it, it makes sense to uh, to swerve from some guys like that that are going to be very popular um, in your tournaments. So it's, that's definitely good. Uh, Good way to get off of a, two po- a very popular guy. Another way to get off of a popular play is to play um, a different piece of an offense that's going to have yep. uh, someone, and that's where your next play comes in. Martavis Bryant, obviously Heath Miller getting a lot of talk. Um, D'Angelo Williams getting a lot of talk as a value running back. Antonio Brown, as we know, he's he's the name. He's the well-known guy. And uh, Martavis Bryant, though, as we saw, big-time upside. Everyone sees the one big game with Landry Jones, the two touchdowns, and then everyone's on Martavis Bryant then. Catches one touchdown, then has a down game last week, and everyone said, do you remember Martavis Bryant? Because I don't. Yeah, and the beauty of Martavis Bryant and the reason that he's always in play in GPPs for me is that he's a home run threat, whether it's catching a deep ball or catching a short pass like he did from Jones and just using his athleticism and freakish uh I, I freakish athleticism just to run after the catch and, and get after it. Uh, doesn't need a lot of volume to produce. I mean, he's averaging 20 yards per reception for his career, and he's catching almost a touchdown pass per game with 11 and 13 games. So uh, a guy that doesn't need a lot of volume to post a big fantasy point total. And the fact is, Le'Veon Bell was a big piece of that offense. With him out, um, it, it frees up some touches because D'Angelo Williams isn't the pass catching back that Le'Veon Bell is. Now, he's been a, he was a very good fill-in earlier in the season in his two starts, but let's be honest, he's not the same runner as Le'Veon Bell is either. So if there is a slight leaning towards passing the ball just a little bit more, that does create a few more opportunities for Martavis Bryant, even if he isn't you know, the top option or even the second option in that passing attack. Yeah, and I mean, especially if, if Ben Roethlisberger, his mobility is limited, you can get him involved in the short passing game. And um, like we said, like we saw with that big game he had with Andrew <laughs> Jones, you don't need to throw the ball down the field for this guy to uh, to uh, produce. So there's definitely yep. some big-time upside, even if uh, 
they struggle to get the ball down the field. So definitely like that. Um, next up, we've got Brandon LaFell. I know you're a big fan of Brandon LaFell this week. Um, Vegas loves anyone that wears a Patriots jersey. They've got monster upside, 33-point team total roughly, depending on uh, depending on where you're looking. So uh, why don't you give us your, your skinny there on, on Brandon LaFell? I mean, the fact is he's played two games this year. He's rusty, and he still received 15 targets in those two games. That's quite a bit of work for a guy who is arguably the fourth option in his own offense. But when this offense is led by Tom Brady and they don't really care about establishing balance or any of the nonsense that, that goes with uh, – your, your traditional football narrative, you know, you got to run the ball to keep defenses honest. Bill Belichick doesn't care. Bill Be- Belichick wants points. He'll air it out 50 times a game if that's the best route to scoring points. And that means touches for Brandon LaFell. And uh, something else that I will add in, this is a little bit veering off of the statistical analysis point of view that I prefer to lean on for obvious reasons, but LaFell's missed most of the season. He's only played in two games. He's very rusty in his first contest back, dropping six passes. If ever there's a time to get him some extra work, it's in a game that projects to be a blowout. They're 14-point favorites. They should blow the doors off of the Redskins. That means a chance to get some game action for Brandon LaFell, shake off some rust, and get him ready for the stretch run because make no bones about it, this is a Patriots team that's going to be competing for a Super Bowl appearance, and you got to get all of your offensive weapons up to speed. Get Brandon LaFell some extra work against uh, the Redskins this week. You got yourself a guy with a nice high ceiling at a really cheap price tag, and his ownership wasn't too crazy in Thursday's contest. Hovered right around 5%. You get him at 5% and he goes off for a couple touchdown grabs or, heck, even 6 for 80 and a touchdown is easily blowing by his uh, price points on both sides. Yeah, I mean, like you said, uh, it's uh, it's not like Bill Belichick is afraid to uh, to put the pedal to the metal and then <laughs> yep. rip the pedal off, hit you with the pedal, yeah, and exactly. then put the pedal back on and then put it back to the floor. So, uh, yeah, th- that's definitely a situation where you want to have uh, some pieces and – Going to be popular in tournaments as they always are, but LaFell a nice pivot off there. Um, Julius Thomas, a guy. Speaking of low ownership, I know you got some numbers on him from uh, from the Thursday contest. And while you mentioned it's not a great matchup, it's an even tougher matchup for Allen Robinson um, here, yep. likely getting a lot of Darrell Revis and Cromartie. Not an ideal matchup for Hearns either, but as you and I mentioned, he's a guy who can be beat. Kind of a mental type of thing. If he's uh, if he's struggling, then he's a the guy that you know kind of like to get to him a little bit, but this is definitely a situation where you can a- exploit um, a team that's going to have to throw the ball a lot because they're not going to have much run- rushing success against that Jets front seven. No, Football Outsiders ranks the uh, Jets as the number one run defense in the league. They are stout, and when you've got guys like Sheldon Richardson and Muhammad Wilkerson and Leonard uh, Williams, it's pretty easy to understand why they're so good against the run. That means airing it out a little bit more. Uh, the Jaguars have been willing to throw the football this year as it stands. And if Allen Robinson's taken away uh, to Revis Island, then that leaves Allen Hearns and Julius Thomas to pick up the slack. Thomas was very good in his second game of the year, going 7-78-1. and one. Um, Last uh, in their last contest in London, wasn't really needed in a game where the Jaguars raced out to a big lead early thanks to a couple of defensive scores and E.J. Manuel being terrible. Um, but I think this is a game where you're going to see Thomas more involved just based on the other matchups around the field. And uh, I really lit up when I saw the ownership rates uh, from last night's games. 0.6% ownership from Julius Thomas. He's a freak athlete. He's got a nose for the end zone. Already has a touchdown grab in one of the three games this year. Has been targeted at times by Blaine, Gab- uh, Blaine Gabbert. Good God. Um, <laughs> Blake Bortles. Um my wrong Jag- wrong year, apparently, for Jaguar quarterbacks. And uh, Blaine Gabbard on the mind, somehow starting an NFL game again, which blows my mind. But um, Julius Thomas, I- again, I don't love the matchup, but I like his matchups defensively much better than that of Allen Robinson and slightly better than that of Allen Hearns. Because if good Antonio Cromartie shows up, then it really pushes Julius Thomas to the uh, forefront of being the top target in that passing game. Yeah, and I mean, Julius Thomas not a, an easy cover for anyone anyway. I mean, he's he's nope. a big target, and he can make plays down the field. So it's not just simply a red zone target. It's a between-the-20s play as well, so you definitely got to like that. All right, that's going to wrap things up for us here this week. Find us on Twitter at DF Cafe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out all the rest of our great content at DailyFantasyCafe.com.